Welcome to the first lecture of the NMR spectroscopy course. In this class, we will be trying to understand the very basics of NMR. And in order to do that, we will be starting with the first definition of what is spectroscopy. The basic definition of spectroscopy is the study of interaction of light with matter. This is what all the standard textbooks tell you. So what is light? The light we refer to the electromagnetic radiation. So let's take a quick look at the electromagnetic uh, spectrum so that we understand how different spectroscopies work. What is displayed here is called an electromagnetic spectrum. This indicates as a function of energy, I am sure you guys might remember, E equal to hc by lambda. Here the value of lambda is provided in nanometers just so that uh, it is easy to see low uh, wavelengths. And what you are able to understand is that as you go from low energy to high energy, so this is the lower energy of the spectrum, this is the higher energy of the spectrum, that we associate these wavelengths with different types of radiations. For instance, the ones that you see here are the lower end of the spectrum is what is used for TV and radio signals. And most often these are referred to as radio waves. And if we go a little further, we have the microwave region which we employ routinely in our home in order to warm up some food. Then you have thermal and IR sources. Once again, this is also well known when you heat a, a pan to uh, prepare your food. Basically, you are using the thermal and the IR sources, of course. And then comes something that is visible to us, which is expanded in the lower inset. What one is able to realize is that there is a short region here where we are able to see different colors. So as you go lower in wavelength, then you hit the ultraviolet region and then followed by X-rays and gamma rays which are of the highest of energies. With a, such a range of energy being available to you, you would be able to probe the matter that is present in your hand. In terms of a chemist, you are looking at the molecule that you have synthesized or the material that you are trying to characterize. When somebody says we are running NMR or MRI, they end up exploiting the radio frequency waves, often referred to as RF waves. What are the features of NMR therefore? NMR uses radio waves. Since they are of the lowest energy, they are non-invasive in nature. Non-invasive implies that when you end up using your sample to do NMR, you will actually get the sample back without any changes. NMR gives you atomistic information, meaning that you would be able to associate every atom that is present in your molecule with a certain observable. And on top of it, NMR gives you sharp resonances. Without going into further details, this is associated with a phenomenon called spontaneous emission. The phenomenon of spontaneous emission results in very broad resonances. And the sharp resonances in NMR comes up because of the fact that NMR has the highest of wavelengths, Im implies that it uses lowest of frequencies. Spontaneous emission goes with the third power of the exciting frequency which means that spontaneous emission is very, very slow in terms of nuclear magnetic resonance. Therefore, one ends up getting very sharp resonances. After you excite, the lifetime of excited states are high enough in the order of milliseconds to seconds, which once again results in the fact that you have very sharp resonances that are present. But all these come at a cost, which we will be seeing further in this lecture, that makes NMR an insensitive experiment. When someone refers to the fact that NMR is insensitive, it implies the fact that you need high concentration of your material in order to pursue your experiments. At best, you are looking at nanomolar, but that for that you need very, very high end spectrometers. But routinely, micromolar to millimolar concentrations is what NMR works the best in. Now, let's take a look at a few examples so that we understand this better. 
Let's begin NMR of one of the most simplest and commonly found molecules in life. That is water. Water as we know is given as H2O where the oxygen is bond covalently bonded with two protons. And one immediately observes that these two protons are related by symmetry meaning that they are one and equivalent when you rotate it through this axis or have a plane that passes through the plane of the molecule itself. If you end up getting a NMR spectrum, you are going to have only one resonance for water. So all that it indicates is how many different protons are present. Let's go to methanol. In methanol, this methyl group and the proton are different from one another and within this methyl group, since there is fast rotation about the CO bond, these three protons end up being equivalent to one another while this ends up being different. So when you try to get the NMR spectrum of methanol, you are going to get something of this sort. You get two resonances. So let's write this is for H2O. This will be the resonance for the methyl group. This will be resonance for the hydroxyl proton present in methanol. Okay, now let's take a look at the next example, which is the molecule ethanol. How many different protons do we see? We see methyl protons. We see methylene protons. Then we observe hydroxyl protons. Therefore, we expect three resonances in the NMR spectrum. The number of chemically different protons each would give a signal. NMR is a technique which is sensitive to the local electronic environment. Since this proton is attached to an electronegative atom, it ends up coming higher in energy. We will be taking a look at what kind of units we use in NMR as we go forward. As in any other spectroscopy, you always plot intensity as a function of energy. In general spectroscopy, one plots energy from left to right, but in NMR we plot it from right to left. We observe that the protons that are bonded to electronegative atom ends up coming higher in the energy, followed by protons that are closer to the electronegative atom, followed by the ones that are farther away. The parameter that helps you distinguish the electronic environment is called the chemical shift. The number of resonances that end up coming in form of chemical shift indicates how many different protons, chemically different protons are present in your molecule. In addition to this, the NMR spectrum offers even more information. The methylene group that has three neighboring protons that are three bonds away ends up coming as something what we call as a quartet. Basically, it comes as a 1 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1 set of resonances into a single resonance that ends up coming. Of course, the average should have matched here. That's coming up due to the lag in the way I'm drawing it. And this methyl proton that has two neighboring methylene protons ends up coming as a triplet in the ratio 1 is to 2 is to 1. So, this one we call as a quartet and this one we call as a triplet. This information of being triplet and quartet also helps one understand what kind of neighbors are present for the methylene and the methyl group. So this is the added level of advantage which you end up getting on top of chemical shift. This parameter is called scalar coupling. This is an important parameter because the difference in energy between this, these two peaks and these peaks will actually be same in this case and this will also match with the energy difference between the peaks that are found in the methyl group. Therefore, one can actually find out how many neighbors are present from the multiplicity and whether they are indeed neighbors from the magnitude of the scalar coupling. In addition to these parameters that one can discern from NMR, if you end up integrating these resonances, you will get a ratio such as 3, 2 and 1, which indicates how many protons are equivalent to one another. 
So this is the integral, which helps you quantitate within the molecule how many similar protons are present for a given resonance that we observe. So these three parameters of chemical shift, scalar coupling and integrals are the most sought after parameter for a chemist in order to characterize his or her molecule. The question could be, can you distinguish methanol from its isomer? dimethyl ether. The answer would be straightforward here because you realize both the methyl groups are equivalent to one and another. So you are going to get only one resonance here, not three resonances as you ended up observing in ethanol. As an exercise, I request you guys to predict the number of resonances for C5H12. As you would remember, you have different isomers that are possible for C5H12. I request you to draw the structure and predict the number of resonances that end up coming. Similar to the proton NMR, we can also exploit carbon NMR. For instance, in the case of ethanol, you end up having two different carbons that are present. So therefore, in a carbon NMR, you end up getting two resonances. In the case of dimethyl ether, since both the methyl groups are equivalent, you end up getting one carbon signal. So therefore, by combining proton and carbon NMR spectroscopy, many of the synthetic chemists run their everyday lab in order to ensure that they are able to confirm whether their chemical transformation has succeeded or not.